Well, again, welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm so glad that you're all here this morning. Uh, you all look great. Uh, and also, this is probably the only time you're going to see Kyle and I wearing a tie on the same Sunday. So, uh, yeah, we're really glad that you're here today. That you joined us for this uh, Easter Sunday service. Uh, you're all looking good, but here's the question. Are you happy? Hmm. Are you happy? Really happy? See, happiness comes and goes, doesn't it? It really goes, uh, it comes and goes based on our circumstances, uh, let me give you some examples. If you are going to go to grandma's house today and you love going to grandma's house and you love your relatives, all of them, you're happy. You're happy about that. But if there are some relatives you don't get along with so well, maybe you're not so happy that you have to go. Or maybe you'd rather be doing something else this afternoon with your time. Uh, or, or how about this? You're, you're finishing up spring break. This is the last few hours of your freedom and you have to go to school tomorrow, you're not happy, unless you love school, and then you are happy. <laughs> but what if you're just starting your spring break, and you got an entire week off of school this week? Ooh, now you're happy, unless you love school, and then you're not happy. <laughs> Maybe you were made to come to church today. It is Easter, and so, uh, okay. I have to go, but I'm not going to be happy about it. Uh, that may be you this morning. Uh, you don't have to admit that. But, uh, or maybe, you know, this is the highlight of your year. You are, you are a follower of Christ. You love Jesus. You are a wholehearted follower of Christ. And so that you would not want to be anywhere else but here this morning on this Resurrection Sunday. So you're happy. So you see how happiness comes and goes in our lives based on our circumstances? The Brewers won yesterday. I'm happy. If they lose today, I won't be happy, right? I want to see a sweep, right? So you see how it comes and goes. Uh, our, our happiness is very much based on our circumstances, and happiness seems to be even more elusive these days. Maybe you feel that, or you sense that. Uh, there was actually an article that appeared in the Wall Street Journal on March 19th, 2024, just a couple weeks ago, uh, entitled, U.S. No Longer Ranks Among the World's 20 Happiest Countries. According to the Gallup World Poll for World Happiness, yeah, there is a group measuring this. The United States fell from 15th to the 23rd happiest country in the world. The biggest reason, because there has been a drop of happiness among young adults. And the article actually talks more about this and how young adults are less and less happy. Why? They say that social media has made them increasingly lonely, hurt, and isolated. Hmm. Hmm. The irony of social media is that it promises greater connectivity, but it makes people feel lonely and isolated and unhappy. So we live in a culture that promises happiness. If we do this, or if we be our true selves, or if we accomplish this, or if we have this new thing, or we go to this place, then we'll be happy. Or if we have a particular experience, then we'll be happy. But it always comes up dry. Lasting happiness is not found by looking inward. It is not found in personal success or the collection of cool stuff. Or having fun, fun experiences. You know, we may be happy initially with all these things, but that wears off. Our circumstances inevitably will change. So everyone's in this culture, everyone in this time, we're, we're chasing this lasting, full happiness, and we, we're looking for it in the things of this world, but we keep coming up empty. Why? <laughs> because what we're looking for is a transformed life, a fully satisfying life, really a new life. And that is exactly what Resurrection Sunday is all about. That's what it's all about. For the last seven months, uh, if you've been around Community Church, we have been studying the book of what? Acts. We've been studying the book of Acts and we've been looking at the early church the bodily resurrection of Jesus is a key element of 
their message. They kept bringing it up again and again and again. We see it in, I was actually thinking about just reading all the passages, but then we'd be here much longer. Uh, So I'll just tell you, it's in Acts 1, Acts 2, Acts 3, Acts 4, Acts 5. Should I keep going? Acts 10, Acts 13, Acts 17. They they keep talking about this bodily resurrection of Jesus, that he didn't stay in the grave, that he rose again. And they keep talking about it. It is the cornerstone of the gospel message. Because if Jesus stayed dead, there's no good news. There's no good news. And so they're saying, Jesus, the Lord and Savior, is alive. He is risen. He is risen what? Indeed. He is risen indeed. So Paul, the Apostle Paul, told the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. It's in vain. It's meaningless. But... As it is, Christ has been raised from the dead. But how does the resurrection of Jesus make a difference in my life in 2024? Open your Bible to Romans chapter 6. That's where we're going to be today, Romans chapter 6. If you have a Bible with you, hope you do, turn to Romans chapter 6. If you didn't bring a Bible, uh, turn to the person next to you and say, can I have your Bible? And if they don't have one, then open your phone and find a Bible app, and we're going to look at Romans chapter 6. If you grabbed one of those hardback, there were hardback copies of God's Word on a card as you came in. It's page 1001, Romans chapter 6. This is where we're going to go. Again, the question, how does the resurrection of Jesus make a difference in my life today? The resurrection does three things according to Romans 6. If you're taking notes, it's on the back of your bulletin. If you're taking notes, here's number one. The resurrection gives us a new identity. The resurrection gives us a new identity. There's three aspects to this new identity. First, we died to sin. We died to sin. Look at verse 1 of Romans 6. What should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Paul is addressing the person who might say, ha, God is a God of grace and forgiveness. Great. I'll take that. I'll take God's grace and then I'll live however I want and I'll go to heaven. The more I sin, the more God's grace will be multiplied. It will be poured out on me. So grace is my kind of get out of jail free card. It's my insurance policy. So Paul is saying, should you, you, someone might say this, should we continue in sin that grace may multiply? Verse two, look at verse two. Here's the answer to his own question. Absolutely not. I, I don't know if he could be more emphatic than that. Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? We should not continue in sin because all who are in Christ have died to sin. This is our new identity. There is a dramatic change that happens when we receive Jesus as Savior. So in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it is clear that before Christ we are dead in our sins. Romans 6, this, this verse, Romans 6, 2, says once we have trusted Christ, we are dead to our sins. You see the difference? Before Christ, we're dead in our sins. When we have Christ as our Savior, we're dead to our sins. Or we might use this language today. Sin, you're dead to me. You're dead to me. We should consider sin like a stench of death. Something rotten. We don't live with that stench. We don't want to. We rid ourselves of it. Now, I don't know if you were as preparing, you know, for maybe an Easter brunch or an Easter meal today. You're, you're doing some cooking. You're doing some preparation of food. And you open your refrigerator and you, you, you start cleaning it out a little bit. And, and you open your fridge and, and then you realize, uh-oh, there's some, some containers in the back. Some food I forgot about. Has this ever happened to you? And you're reaching back there and you're finding things and then you, oh, I don't remember eating that. (laughs) And you pull out the container and you open it. Oh, you open it up. It's disgusting. There's like a whole forest growing 
in there and it smells disgusting and you, do you eat that? No, it's disgusting to us. We throw it out. We put it down the garbage disposal. We, we get our Clorox out. I mean, we, we just, we totally rid ourselves of it. My friends, listen, this is how we should look at sin. The sin in our lives should be a stench to us. It's like rotten food. Our sin should really disgust us. It should make us sick because it's dead. It's rotten to us. We don't partake anymore. Now, yes, we will still slip. We will still sin, but we we hate it. We apologize. We repent. We turn from it. If we think, if you think sin is no big deal, then you don't really understand that the old has gone and the new has come in Christ. We cannot continue in sin. That's not who we are anymore. We have a new identity, and our new identity as a Christian is that the old me, that person is dead. That person's gone. This leads to the second aspect of our new identity. You ready for it? Here it is. We are united with Christ. We are united with Christ. Verses three and four. Look at verse three. Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So let's talk about this, this term baptized into. This is a a picture of what has happened to our souls. It also is shown when we're baptized, literally, when we physically are immersed in the water. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But this is the language of union. And we're seeing it, we're going to see it throughout this passage today. Union, united with Christ. We are one with him. Now, I really want us to get this concept, so I'm going to give us several illustrations of what union looks like. Okay, union with Christ, united with Christ. We see it in sports. So anybody watching the NCAA tournament? Anybody watching some of those games? Okay, so, okay only eight people like <laughs> NCAA basketball. I'm a little surprised about that. But uh, every year, a team loses, and the cheerleader does this. That she was famous last year, I guess. Many memes were made from this gal. I feel bad for her. She was all crying because her team had lost. Why? Why? Because she was united to her team. Her team's loss was her what? Her loss. It was her loss. She was grieving. They lost. Or, or maybe I like this one. This is a, a member of the band. Villanova. <laughs> Why? She's united to her team. She's one with her team. That when her team loses, she loses. Okay, so I don't have pictures of these, but like you've been to a, a sporting event where you're watching your kid, your grandkid, your niece, your nephew playing on the sports field or on the court. And you look around and you see the parents and the grandparents and they lose their minds. <laughs> Why? They're, because they're united. They're one. They're, they're in union with this child, this grandchild, this niece, this nephew. And when they succeed, the people in the stands succeed somehow. Or when they fail, the people in the stands fail and they lose it. Because we're united. We're, we're one. That's union. Uh, we've, uh, as a family, we've kind of found our way back to the good old game, game Monopoly. And we've been playing it a lot more lately. And uh, this last week, we played a couple times. Uh, we played earlier this week, and I, I, I actually was able to put together some nice properties. And uh, I was able to build some houses. This is my, uh, this is Adam Land over here. Uh, <laughs> It was a trap. Uh, The community chest is your only hope. Uh, Because if you land on uh, the the one, one of the ones with two houses, you owed $390. If you land on the uh, one where the figure is, it's $1,000. So I was was going going for the win here, right? So my wife (laughs) landed on, no, oh, that was too early. Go back, go back. Okay, so... My wife landed on uh, North Carolina uh, Avenue, and she owed me $390. And her very next turn, listen, her very next turn, guess what she rolled? Snake eyes. (laughs) Two. (laughs) 
one, two. She ended up paying me another thousand dollars. It kind of ruined her. But, and, and I really tried to keep it in. This is me trying to keep it in. Good job. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't, I had to be careful. I live with her. Um, and she looked at me and she said, well, you know, since we're married, your win is my win. <laughs> right? Is that how that works? Do, do we understand union? Do we understand what this means? Union. What's mine is yours. What's yours is mine. We are in one another. So this concept of union permeates this entire passage of Romans 6. So we have to get that. We have to get what God is teaching us here. So coming back to the text, when, when we repent of going our own way, we put our faith in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation, what happens is we're united with Christ, like a marriage. In a real sense, when Christ died, we died. When Christ was buried, we were buried. And when Christ was raised, we were raised to new life. So this is, in a real sense, what's happened to us. If you are a believer in Christ, you died with Christ. You were buried with him. You were raised to new life with him. One of the best ways to illustrate that is baptism. So that's why Paul uses this term, baptized into Christ Jesus. Paul's audience would have understood what Christian baptism was. That when they were baptized, it symbolized their union with Christ. So when you hit the water in baptism, bam, you've died. When you are going under the water, you're buried with Christ. And when you are pulled out of the water, you are raised with Christ to newness of life. That is a picture of the resurrection. This is why in Galatians 3, Paul uses similar language, uh, Galatians 3.27, for those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. So our union with Christ means we are clothed with Christ and his righteousness. So we, we have this old self that's like dirty rags, like filthy garments, worn out, ugly. And we rid ourselves of that old self. We rid ourselves of those old clothings. And we, we put on Christ in his splendor, his radiant, beautiful, perfect clothing. His righteousness clothes us. We're clothed with Christ. So that when God sees us, if you're a believer in Christ, when God sees you, he sees not your dirty old self. He sees your new self. That is the identity in Christ. He sees the righteousness of Jesus on you and you are counted as righteous. This baptism picture continues in verse four. Look at verse four. Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. Newness of life. So buried with him. This is union. We were buried with him. We went into the grave with him. And when someone is buried, we know this from experience. If you have someone you love who has died, that person's been buried. There's a finality to it. It's permanent. Commentator Leon Morris puts it this way, Christ's death was no momentary faint, but real death, death followed by the tomb. Jesus really died, and our identification with that death is also complete. Here it is, an old way of life passes away completely. But notice in verse 4, like Jesus, we didn't stay dead, but we were raised with him. This is, again, this is union language. It continues. We were united with Jesus in his death, burial, and his resurrection. That means we have a new life in Christ, a new identity, and the change is dramatic. Once lost, now found. Once blind, now see. Once dead, now alive. The resurrection gives us a new identity. That's the first thing the resurrection does. Here's the second thing. The second thing the resurrection does for us, it frees us from the power of sin. Hallelujah. 
It frees us from the power of sin. Look at verse 5. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly be also be united with him in the likeness of his resurrection. This is union language continued. You see this? United with him in what? In the likeness of his death, in the likeness of his resurrection. So the old reformer, John Calvin, says our death is not the same as Christ's, but it is similar to it, which is why Paul uses the word likeness. It's like that. The likeness of his death, the likeness of his resurrection. So we did not physically die when we became Christians, did we? No. We, we, we died. Our old self died. And we didn't physically come back to life, but our spirit came to life. This is what Jesus meant when he told Nicodemus at night, you must be born again. That being born again is this newness of life, being resurrected with Christ. Pastor R. Ken Hughes puts it this way. He says, we are so profoundly identified with Christ's death and resurrection that we actually did die with him and truly were raised with him so that we now share in his resurrection life. This becomes even more clear in verses 6 and 7. Look at the text. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin since a person who has died is freed from sin. So again, crucified with him, union. We see this also in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Because we died with Christ and were raised with him, we are freed from the penalty and power of sin. John Stott says it this way. God's end purpose is our freedom from sin's tyranny, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Commentator Doug Moo adds this, living a life pleasing to God flows from the real experience of liberation from sin's domain secured by God for us in Christ. Sin here is personified as a master and we are its slaves. But since we have been crucified with Christ, since we died with Christ, we were raised to newness of life in Christ, we are no longer slaves to sin. We have a new master, God, a God who loves us, a God who is our heavenly father. So that means we will not sin anymore. Is that what that means? Because if that's true, I'm in trouble (laughs) because I still sin, you still sin. Even after we know Christ, even after we're died with him and raised with him, we still sin, we still fall, we still falter. In Christ, we are freed from the power of sin and from the penalty of sin, but we still struggle with the presence of sin, don't we? All of us. We still struggle with the presence of sin. It's a lifelong battle, lifelong struggle. John Wesley once said that sin remains even though it does not reign. Sin remains even though it does not reign. We still struggle with sin. Even after becoming believers, we still deal with the presence of sin, but praise God, we are no longer under the power of sin. We don't have to sin. We are free. Early on in my ministry as a young youth pastor, I remember sitting in a meeting where there was a man in our church who claimed to be a believer, but anger had completely taken over his life. It was ruining his relationships. It was ruining his marriage. He was an angry, angry man. And I remember sitting in this meeting as this young pastor and following the lead of the lead pastor. And I remember what this man said when we confronted him on this anger issue. And he said, well, this is just who I am. No, no. If you're in Christ, you're not enslaved to the power of sin. It was as if he was saying, I'm a slave to this sin. It's just who I am. It's just who I'm going to be. The resurrection frees us from the power of sin. We can increasingly find victory as we submit to the Holy Spirit, as we submit to God, and we can find this freedom, this slow and gradual freedom from anger, selfishness, pride, lust, greed, gossip, slander, the list goes on. 
That's the good news. That's what the resurrection does. The resurrection gives us a new identity. The resurrection frees us from the power of sin. And third, the resurrection gives us a new life. The resurrection gives us a new life. Verses 8 through 10. So what is this new life? First, it is life with Christ. Life with Christ. Look at verses 8 through 10. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So what does that mean? Jesus was raised to life. And if we are in union with him, we united with him, that means that we will live with him. Verse 8. There is no better life than life with Christ. He is our savior. He is the bread of life. He is our good shepherd. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We find lasting happiness in our new life with Christ because worshiping God and knowing Jesus is what we were created for. It's what we were made for. Life with Christ means is is new birth into a living hope. Uh, 1 Peter 1.3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through what? What does it say? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because of the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus was a true and full resurrection. He had a new redeemed body. And he can never die again. Romans 6, 9 is clear about that. He can never die again. John Stott says this, Jesus was not resuscitated, brought back to this life like Lazarus. Instead, he was resurrected, raised to an altogether new plane of living. And in Revelation chapter one, Jesus himself declares, I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Jesus' resurrection conquers our last enemy, which is death. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says, the last enemy to be abolished is death. Now we all kind of live with this fear of it, don't we? We don't want to die. We're afraid of death. But because of the resurrection of Jesus, we do not have to fear death. If we have put our faith in Christ alone for eternal salvation. And maybe you've never done that before. Maybe you've never turned to Jesus in faith and really received this eternal life in him. I want to give you a chance to do that before we leave today. So the resurrection gives us a new life. A life with Christ. And second, a changed life. A changed life. Look at verse 11. This is the last verse. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So this word, consider yourselves, is really key in Romans. Consider, reckon, regard, count yourselves, what? Dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. There's that union language again. Keeps popping up. This new life we receive is a changed life. Commentator Leon Morris says, Christ's death and resurrection has altered our position. And we should live in accordance with the new reality. Do you want to change? Do you want to change? Do you want to stop hurting others with your sinful words, your sinful deeds? Listen, you need to hear this. The resurrection of Jesus and our union with him means we can, even must change. We have a changed life. It's not pretending, it's not fake, it's real, it's true change from the inside out. I'm a different person now because of Jesus. It's actually odd if I don't change. If I'm a believer in Christ and I don't change, that's odd, there's something wrong. It's like if you, you, you think about a, a couple who gets married and then a couple days after their honeymoon, they split and they, they live a single life. They go back to their singleness, what? Why, why would they do that? 
They're united together. Why would they split? <laughs> that makes no sense at all. And in the same way, if you, if you claim to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus, but you're continuing in sin and not changing, not desiring to change, not willing to change, that's just as odd as a couple getting married and going back to single life. We are in union with Christ, and that union leads to a changed life. You become a different person. A life surrendered to Jesus is a life that's becoming more like Jesus. And that, I want to tell you, that is where true and lasting happiness is found. True and lasting happiness is found when the person I once was, I am no longer. I don't do the things I used to do. I don't go the places I used to go. I don't say the things I used to say. I don't act the way I used to act. Why? Because I have a new life. I'm, I'm, I have a changed life because of the resurrection. John Stott says this, for our union with Jesus Christ has severed us from the old life and committed us to the new. We have died and we have risen. So here's the big question for you, for some of you this morning, is have you been given a new identity? Have you been freed from the power of sin? Have you been given a new life? This is the way to true and lasting happiness and joy. Really, the better word is joy. A joy that lasts despite our circumstances. So you might say, well, how can I get this new identity, find this freedom, be given this new life? First, you need to recognize that you're dead in your sins, that you have sinned, that you've rebelled against God, your creator. You need to change your mind about yourself and about God. And you need to turn to Jesus in faith. Here's one passage I want to show you. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. When we confess that Jesus is Lord, what we're saying is, I'm not. I'm not Lord. I'm not in charge of my life. I totally surrender my life to Jesus. He's in charge of me now. That's what it means to say Jesus is Lord. And when we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the, from the dead, we're putting our faith in all that Jesus did, his perfect life, his death on the cross in our place, his burial, his resurrection. And when you do this, when you surrender to Jesus, when you put your faith in him alone, you will be saved for eternity. You will receive this new identity. You will be freed from the power of sin and you will be given new life. So if that's you this morning, you haven't made this decision, what's holding you back? What's holding you back from making this decision? So the very next verse in Romans 10, Romans 10, 11, says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. If you're making this decision right now in your heart, maybe the Holy Spirit is stirring something in you and you're, you're making this decision to turn to Jesus in faith, will you tell someone? I hope you will. Maybe tell someone that brought you this morning, the person you came with, or talk to a member of our prayer team after the service. We'll be at the front, or fill out a connect card and let us know. You can check the box on there that says, today I made the decision to let Jesus lead my life. And we would love to follow up with you, help you take your next steps of what it looks like to follow Jesus, what this new identity looks like. And if you, if you do have this new identity, you have been freed from the power of sin. You have been given new life in Christ. My question for you is, are you living it out? Are you living it out? Look at Romans 6, 12 and 13. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires and do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness but as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. So brothers and sisters in Christ, are you letting sin reign in your mortal body, in your body? Are you obeying sinful desires? We shouldn't. We've been set free from the power of sin. We don't have to live under its oppression any longer. We don't have to live as if we are still slaves to sin. We should use our bodies as weapons for righteousness, our thoughts, our words, our actions. 
Later on in Romans 13, Paul says this, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Now that is very countercultural, isn't it? We have been raised with Christ to a new life. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So, brothers and sisters in Christ, what sins do we need to repent of today, this week? We've been given a new identity. We are in Christ. Let's walk with him. Let's follow him. Let's obey him. So let's come back to the question I asked at the beginning. Are you happy? This is probably the wrong question. Do you have joy? Put it that way. Do you have joy? When Jesus rose from the dead on that first resurrection Sunday, his disciples were totally confused. (laughs) They didn't didn't see this coming. In fact, they were afraid. They were locked up in a room. They were afraid of the religious leaders. And then all of a sudden, Jesus showed up. He stood among them. And what did he say in John 20, 19? He said, peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. They rejoiced. They had deep and lasting joy when they saw the risen Lord Jesus. And Peter was there. He was one of those disciples who saw the Lord's hands and his side. And later in his life, he wrote to a group of Christians who didn't see Jesus in the flesh and they were being persecuted and it was hard and look at what Peter said in 1 Peter 1 he said though you have not seen him you love him though not seeing him now you believe in him and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith the salvation of your souls Are you looking for joy today? Joy is found in living out our new identity, not giving into sinful desires and living a new life, a life with Christ, a changed life. Jesus is alive. He is risen. Oh, what a savior. Let's trust him. Let's follow him. Let's obey him and let's worship him. Will you stand with me? Let's stand together and we're gonna sing.